Okay, well here we are, the final lesson, lesson number 13 in our series on the life of Jesus. Uh, the last lesson in this uh, series. And uh, tonight we're going to cover the events of the seventh and final period of Jesus' life that include the resurrection, the appearances, and the final ascension. Now last time we met, uh, we uh, ended with the Jews uh, who were demanding and obtaining permission to uh, post a guard at Jesus' tomb in order to guarantee against any tampering by his, uh, his followers. And we also learned of the women disciples whose intention was to return to the grave after the Sabbath in order to uh, properly prepare Jesus' body for final rest. And so that's where we left off uh, last week. Now, there are three main events that took place after the death and the burial of Jesus. Each of these are described in a series of scenes described by the gospel writers. So we'll start, first of all, uh, I just want to show you the slide about the seven periods of Jesus' life that we have covered. This is the last time you're going to see this slide, the boyhood period, the beginning of his public ministry, the first uh, Passover to the second, the second to the third Passover, the third Passover to the final week, then last week we talked about the last Passover to the crucifixion, and today we're talking about the resurrection, the appearances, and the ascension. So those seven periods have been covered by these 154 uh, different events that we've looked at. Okay, so we're at event number 140, which is the uh, resurrection of Jesus um, in Matthew chapter 28, verses two to four. It's interesting, only Matthew describes what actually took place before the uh, women arrived that morning uh, to find the empty grave. And basically he says there was a severe earthquake and this coincided with the descent of an angel. Uh, he rolled the stone away from the entrance and sat upon it. The soldiers guarding the tomb fainted and the angel's appearance was like lightning and his clothing was white. Now, we're not told how Jesus left the tomb or if he said anything, only the angel's appearance and the guards' reaction. They fainted, they did not see the Lord because he showed himself only to believers after his uh, resurrection. Event number 141. Uh, the women find the empty tomb, and that is recorded in Matthew 28, 1, Mark 16, 1 to 4, Luke 24, 1 to 3, and John 20, 1 and 2. All four writers describe this scene. Mary Magdalene and uh, Jesus' Aunt Mary and Joanna and others come to the tomb to finish the burial process. Again, isn't this a natural thing? No mystical there, his relatives. His relatives come to take, to take care of him. But they find the tomb empty and open. By now the soldiers have run back to the chief officials with their story. Mary Magdalene immediately returns to tell the apostles, leaving the other women alone at the graveside. Event number 142. The angels speak to the women Matthew 28, five to seven, Mark 16, five to eight, and Luke 24, four to eight. So the women who remain see the two angels and also become afraid. They uh, invite the women uh, to inspect the tomb, or the tomb and they tell them to go and tell the disciples what has taken place all according to what was promised. They also tell the women, the angels that is, tell the women that Jesus has gone to Galilee. Now we know our geography by now. He's gone where? He died in the south. Where does he go? He goes back to the north. Why? That's his home. That's the home of all these other disciples, or most of them. And he goes back there to meet his disciples. Why does he go back there to meet his disciples? Well, you can be sure that the disciples didn't stay in Jerusalem. They went back home. So the women also leave with the intention of telling the disciples that the Lord has risen from the dead. Event number 143, Peter and John arrive at the tomb, Luke 24, 12, Mark 16, uh, 1. I've got them in reverse order, Mark first, then Luke, then John 23 to 10. So the other women have left the scene to tell the apostles and the disciples 
Uh, and so Peter and John arrive at the tomb. They've been told by Mary Magdalene, and while the others were skeptical, Peter and John have raced to the scene ahead of Mary, who is trailing behind. John arrives first, but he waits for Peter to go inside. And once inside, they see the linen wrappings on the ground and the towel used to cover his face, face that is rolled up in a, in a corner. John says that once they saw the empty tomb, they believed and they understood what Jesus had been telling them concerning the resurrection. It's amazing, you know, we, you know, we, we say, well, I would have believed, you know, I, I would have done it, because we have a frame of reference, right? All of our lives we've been taught Jesus rose from the dead, so you know, rising from the dead, we've been taught these things as Christians from an early age, but for them this concept was so unbelievable, so not within their mind frame that only after the resurrection took place were they starting to grasp what Jesus had said. And even then they doubted. There's another passage that says that. Now, we're going to talk about the different appearances next. That's, that's the uh, information that we have. And it's hard to put the appearances in order because there's a small time frame and there's not a lot of background appearances. So we'll do the best we can here. Event number 144, the first appearance, and that's to Mary Magdalene, Mark chapter 16, 9, and John 20, 11 to 18. So after Peter and John have seen the empty tomb and they leave, Mary Magdalene arrives once again at the scene. Remember, she was the first one there to, to notice that you know, no, no one was there and uh, among the other women, and then she ran to tell the apostles, they run back to the tomb ahead of her. Now she shows up. And the Bible says that she does see two angels sitting in the tomb who ask her why she is weeping. And when she goes outside, she sees Jesus, whom she mistakes for the gardener at first, and she asks where they've taken the Lord's body. And when Jesus speaks, she recognizes him and tries to cling to him, but Jesus does not permit it, but rather sends her to tell the apostles of his resurrection and imminent ascension. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, she does this thing. So that's the first appearance. Appearance number two um, uh, is to the other women, Matthew 28, 8, 10. Only Matthew talks about this. The other women who had seen the angels and were en route to the city are now visited by the resurrected Christ while they're on their way. Matthew reports that the women took hold of his feet and worshiped him and he told them what the angels had said, to go tell the disciples that he would meet them in Galilee. Isn't it interesting that Jesus appears to the women first, not to the apostles, to the women first. Remember, these women had followed him as well, and these women had supported him financially in his ministry, and had supported him in many other ways as well. Martha and Mary, you know, welcoming him into their home, and so on and so forth. All right, uh, now we, uh, we move away from the appearances, and uh, we, we get another scene that opens up, and this is the priests uh, with the guards. Remember, the guards have you know, woken up, and and have fled and gone to see the priests, Matthew 28, 11 to 15. So while all of this is going on with Jesus' disciples, Matthew reports that the guards who had fainted at the appearance of the angels have now gone to their superiors to tell them what has happened. Uh, let's face it, they're in trouble. They're supposed to guard this thing. So they're in trouble since it was their duty to guard the tomb, so the Jewish leaders arranged to pay them a bribe to claim that the body was stolen while they slept. Not a good thing, why were you sleeping? So they agree in exchange for the promise that if this came to the attention of Pilate, the priests would vouch for them. So Matthew claimed that this was the, quote, official story given out at the time that he wrote his gospel some 30 or 40 years after the fact. So 30 or 40 years later, between 60 and 70 AD, Matthew writes his gospel and he's saying the story that circulated from the leaders okay, was that somebody came and stole the body. Now, isn't that interesting? Who, I mean, I, I'm just amazed that the political leaders would lie to the people. That doesn't happen, does it? Even in the modern day, do the, the politicians lie about bad things that happen? Maybe try to cover it up with a story? Again, so natural, so human, isn't it? And Matthew is saying, this is the official quote story, the official cover-up that has been 
uh, circulating since the resurrection of Jesus. Okay, so we go back to the appearances now, event number 147. This is the third appearance to Peter, Luke 24, 34. Now, Peter doesn't even mention it in his own writings, but it is left to one of the unnamed apostles to mention it in passing by one of the men who had seen the Lord on the road to Emmaus, the Lord telling them that Jesus had indeed appeared to Simon Peter. Paul confirms this fact in 1 Corinthians 15, 5 with a similar reference. And again, uh, I suppose a credit to Peter and his humility, the fact that he was the one that denied Jesus and received such mercy afterwards, that he doesn't even mention that the Lord appeared to him uh, by himself. Appearance number four, uh, two disciples on the road to Emmaus. Mark 16, 12 and 13, Luke 24, 13. Now we no longer know where Emmaus was located, but it was near Jerusalem. We don't know where that little village was. It's perhaps five, six, seven miles from Jerusalem. The two disciples were on their way after being witnesses of what had happened to Jesus in Jerusalem. So they knew about the crucifixion. They didn't know about the resurrection. So while they're discussing this, Jesus comes along and begins to travel with them, sharing their conversation. They're prevented from recognizing Him as He questions them regarding their discussions. And they tell Him that they were hoping that Jesus would have been the Messiah, but now He's been tortured and killed and they're not so sure. Now like most Jews, they hope the Messiah would be a glorious figure like David, some sort of warrior king. In the Old Testament, Isaiah presented a figure of suffering and servanthood in the 53rd chapter that the Jews saw as a personification of themselves. Even to this day, if you ask Jew, modern Jews, Orthodox Jews, if you ask them, uh, 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 who is the Messiah? And many of them will say, well, we're the Messiah. The collective nation of Israel is the Messiah. The suffering that they've gone through throughout history is the suffering that Isaiah talks about in 53. Of course, Isaiah talks about a single person, a single person. Um, uh, but that's, that's uh, you know, information for another, another lesson. Um, getting back to this uh, appearance number four, the two men on the road to Emmaus, Jesus comes to these two disciples and He explains to them that the Messiah would be of two profiles. Two, two different images of the Messiah. Number one, <clears throat> he would be a suffering servant. It wasn't the Jews who were, uh, who, who were uh, uh, Isaiah's model for his suffering servant. It was the Messiah that he was talking about. Jesus' suffering was not a repudiation of his claim as Messiah. It was a confirmation that he truly was fulfilling all that was written about him in the Old Testament. Some, some Jews thought, well, he, he couldn't be the Messiah. He suffered. But Isaiah is saying the true Messiah will suffer. Exactly the opposite. This was a stumbling block for Jews. And Jesus explains this to these two disciples because they're thinking, we thought He was the Messiah, we believed in the miracles, we accepted the, the messages, but then He suffered and He died. And that doesn't jive with what we think the Messiah should be. And Jesus clarifies this for them and saying, no, you're wrong. The Messiah needed to suffer. That's what the prophets said. That was the fulfillment of that prophecy. And so uh, the first image of the Messiah, the suffering servant, and then the second image, the glorious Savior. Like David who saved his people, Jesus in his resurrection defeats man's greatest enemy and that is death. That's what the resurrection is about. It's the proof positive that he has defeated the enemy of death. David defeated the enemies of the nation, but Jesus defeats the enemy of humanity, which is death caused by sin. So this was the nature of what Jesus taught these two disciples along the road. The clarity that they get, it says that their hearts beat inside of them. Why? Because He was telling them the truth. He was opening the scriptures. He was explaining in context what the scriptures really meant. So as darkness approaches, they invite Him to spend the night with them. And as they ate and Jesus blessed the meal, then they recognize Him and then He disappears from their sight. And so they returned to Jerusalem to report this to the apostles. All right, event 
number 149, appearance number 149, and that is, excuse me, event number 149, that's appearance number five. And appearance number five, Jesus appears to the apostles and the disciples together. Luke 24, 36 to 49 and John 20, 19 to 23. Now, with the two disciples, or rather when the two disciples find the apostles and begin telling them of their experience, in the middle of this, Jesus appears among them. You know, I think about these two disciples from, uh, from, uh, on the road to Emmaus, they get to see him you know, with them in their home, then they get to see him again because they're with the apostles, a double blessing for them. So at, at this first appearance among them, the apostles were frightened and he reassures them by showing his hands and feet and, you know, and asking them for something to eat. Is he hungry? I mean, does he need the food? It's for them, it's not for him. Um, to dispel the idea that he was a, quote, a ghost or a vision or, a, uh, or an appearance. Not only for them, but when they report it later. You know, they can say, we saw the hands, we saw the feet. We saw him eat food, you know, which would dispel this idea that it was only a vision. If it's only a vision, <laughs> that vision isn't eating your fish and your bread and drinking uh, the wine and so on and so forth. So after this, he teaches them what he had taught the two disciples along the road, that according to the scriptures, the Messiah had to suffer, had to die, had to resurrect, and what they were seeing was the true fulfillment of scripture. So John tells us that it's at this point that Jesus breathes on them and gives them the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, they received John's baptism and they were justified at that point, their sins were forgiven, now they receive the indwelling of the Holy Spirit to permit their growth in Christ. In other words, uh, they're justified when they're baptized, when they obey, baptism, uh, they obey John's order to be baptized for the, the remission of their sins, and they receive the gift of the Holy Spirit when Jesus breathes on them, and now the process of sanctification is really going to begin in earnest with the receiving of the Spirit. Of course, today, I mean, from Pentecost until today, we receive both of these gifts at the point of baptism. That's what Peter's talking about in Acts 2.38 when he says, uh, uh, repent, let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Those two things take place at the same time. For the apostles, one took place and then the other took place after the resurrection of Jesus. So after this, he gives them the charge to be his witnesses in preaching the gospel, but to wait in Jerusalem until they receive the empowering from the Holy Spirit. Different thing. The indwelling of the Holy Spirit is about sanctification. Uh, what Paul talks about in Romans 8. Through the power of the Spirit, we overcome sin. Uh, our prayer life is enhanced and so on and so forth. The empowering of the Spirit comes on Pentecost Sunday, gives them the ability to do miracles, not the, same, uh, not the same thing. All right, event number 150, appearance number six, Thomas, Mark 16, John 20. So in the previous appearance to the apostles, Thomas was not among them, but this time he is. Now Mark says that Jesus rebuked them for being hard-hearted and unbelieving. I wonder if that's why he appeared to the women first, because it didn't seem that they were hard-hearted and he appeared to the two men on the road to Emmaus and who his own apostles, who were sometimes the one who were closest to the most skeptical. I don't understand why that is, but it was in this case. John gives a, a fuller description of the scene where Jesus appears with the greeting, peace be with you. And he takes special care in convincing Thomas of his true person. So Thomas acknowledges Jesus as Lord and God and Jesus, uh, you know, this, this may be the rebuke that Mark refers to, says that they have believed because they have seen, but blessed are they who will believe without seeing. So John comments that these things have been recorded for the express purpose of helping those who haven't seen to believe. And that of course is ourselves. Uh, appearance number 151, again, 
event number 151, appearance number seven, the Great Commission, Matthew 28, 16, 20, Mark 16, 15 to 18. So Jesus sends the apostles north into Galilee where the majority of his ministry had taken place uh, and he sends them to a certain mountain. And it is here that he gives them the charge to go into all the world to preach, to baptize, and to teach all disciples the things that he has commanded. Actually, to teach all disciples to obey all the things that he has commanded. So his time for departure is drawing near, so he comforts them with the promise that he will always be with them. Again, he's been with them for three years. They've gone through tremendous emotional upheaval with him, fear and joy and ecstasy in the sense of seeing him in his exalted state and so on and so forth, and now his death, now his resurrection, his appearances. I mean, they've really gone through a lot. And now he says, and I'm leaving again. And so obviously they're going to be uh, upset, they're going to be frightened, and so he reassures that he will always be with them. Event number 152 would be appearance number eight at the Sea of Galilee. John talks about this, uh, John uh, 21 uh, verses one to 25. So John gives another long description of a time when Jesus appears to Peter and the other apostles as they're fishing. And it's here that Peter is reconciled with the Lord in front of the others over his denial. Jesus asks for his love three times. And here is where Jesus gives him back his apostolic ministry. Feed my sheep, he says. Now, there's an explanation why John, uh, by John rather, as to why some in the first century believed that he would not die until Jesus returned. But John says that Jesus merely stated that if he wanted him to remain alive until that time, that was his decision to make and no one else's. What I find interesting is the little, um, historical notes that are put in here about the, the cover story that was circulating in Jerusalem about Jesus' resurrection that had been you know, developed by the priests and the, uh, and the guards and so on and so forth. And this here, this little background story as to why there was confusion in the early church about John, that he would you know, live forever, or that he would be alive when Jesus returned, and how uh, uh, John is correcting this misinformation you, know, you don't see this type of thing in fantasy stories and mystic stories. This is very historical, very personal in nature. And basically he's saying it didn't mean that he would die or he would live, excuse me, until Jesus returned, only that Jesus uh, could do what he wanted. It was up to him. So he completes this chapter with the same kind of editorial comment that the record uh, he kept only contain part of the things that Jesus did. That's where he says it. I'm only giving you a part of what happened. If I wrote everything that took place, there would be no books on earth that could, taint, that could contain it all. And we know because look at, look at if, you, if you go online and just type in Jesus, you, you know, the millions and millions of references and books and so on and so forth that, um, uh, that are simply written based on the little information that we have. Can you imagine? If they wrote down everything that he did in three years, how much information we would have, and that's the point he's making here. Event number 153, appearance number nine to the 500. We have to go out of the Gospels to check out this particular appearance. Uh, first uh, Corinthians 15, six, uh, six to eight. Not all of Jesus' appearances were recorded in the Gospels. They happened during the time of the Gospels. That's why we include it in our event schedule here, but they were written about uh, later on. Paul describes some of Jesus' appearance that fit into the Gospel narrative, but are not included by the writers. So simply for sequence sake, we note that Jesus appeared to over 500 people in Galilee, perhaps when He gave the Great Commission. He also appears to James, his earthly brother, and Paul the Apostle, but this was much later after his ascension. So approximately 549 people recorded as seeing him in different situations, different days, men, women, young, old, you know, all kinds of, in different places, night and day, indoors and outdoors. That type of verification is never ever given for other people, other religions who say that God has spoke to them. When they talk about it in other religions, they talk about they were in a cave by themselves, they discovered something at night. Uh, usually they're by themselves. 
So you, know, you have to believe them because you, you have only their word to confirm what they've seen. But Jesus provides over 500 living witnesses at the time who could corroborate each other's story. Then we have uh, the ascension. That's the uh, 154th um, event. And that would be also the 10th uh, appearance. The final great act recorded by the gospel writers is the ascension of Jesus back into heaven. And for us, it's the 154th and last event recorded Mark 16, 19 to 20, Luke 24, 50 to 53. Luke says that this took place where? In Bethany, of all, not in Jerusalem, at the temple. It took place in Bethany, a place of happy memories with the apostles and disciples and friends. Bethany is the place where he spent time with Mary and Martha and Lazarus, his friend. Bethany is the place where he resurrected Lazarus. Bethany is the place where he had that dinner with Lazarus and that celebration of uh, the resurrection of Lazarus. And so they watched him ascend into heaven as he blessed them. Now together, Mark and Luke record Apostles felt great joy, they returned to Jerusalem and later on preached the good news on the Sunday of Pentecost. And Luke gives a more complete version of, their, of this event in the first chapter of the book of Acts where he explains that the Lord instructed them to remain in Jerusalem to await the baptism with the Holy Spirit which would empower them to do miracles and preach. And why? Because their natural inclination was to go home. Home wasn't Jerusalem, home was north. But Jesus said, no, you stay in Jerusalem because he knew that the preaching of the gospel would begin in Jerusalem and would spread out from Jerusalem to all parts of the world. So in his final words to them, he repeated the charge to be his witnesses to the world. And Luke says that two angels encouraged them to stop looking into the sky, noting that he would return someday in the very same, in the very same way. Okay. So there you go, 154 events that we've gone through, event by event, all the scriptures. If you followed this series, it means that, and you've read all the passages, it means that you've read all four gospels in the last 13, uh, last 13 weeks. Well, since this, this is the last class, I want to share just one lesson. Usually I give you two or three lessons. Just one lesson or thought about this series, and it's this. We, you and me, we are mentioned. Even though Jesus' words were mostly directed toward the apostles and their situation and the work that was ahead of them, Jesus also referred to us directly as well. In John chapter 20, when he tells Thomas and the others that their faith was based on what they had seen, but blessed would be those whose faith would come even though they had not actually seen, I'm telling you, he is talking to you and He's talking to, to me. That's us He's talking about. You know, I always envied those people whose names were actually mentioned in the Bible. I envied them. David and Peter and Lydia and Mary and John. You know, their, their names are there. They, they, they can see the book of life and their names are mentioned. I, I always envied in a way, in a good way I suppose, their names mentioned in the Bible. And how secure they must have felt that their place was so secure that it was actually recorded in the inspired text. Luke and Timothy and Titus, you know, they, they saw their names in the letters. Well, in His kindness, Jesus has made room for all of us in the phrase, blessed are they who did not see and yet believed. Every time you read that passage, realize that your name is included there from Jesus' own lips. And take heart, for He will return one day to call your name one last time to be with Him in heaven forever. Because even though you have not seen through His word, you have believed. Well, that's the end. Uh, Solomon says the end of a matter is always better than the beginning of a matter. So I'm thanking all of you who have uh, stayed with us for this course. I, I thank all those who may be watching this lesson on DVD later on. I hope that it's been a blessing to you. We look forward to our 
uh, future classes. Thank you very much and God bless you. <laughs>